Stanford University. Okay, just to refresh your memory, you know that I started the semester saying that there were a couple of major scientific revolutions, the Copernican Revolution, which helped put the physical world in the realm of science, and then we switched on to the Darwinian Revolution, which put the biological world in the realm of science, and this class then has moved on to the astrobiology revolution, as you all know, which puts the rest of the universe in the context of um, biology, focusing on three big questions. Where do we come from? Are we alone? And uh, where are we going? And if you look at those for just a second, now that you've had half a semester and here or more, you realize that not one of these could really be approached properly without understanding evolution and without the insights that Darwin had. And so sometimes when I'm, I need to explain astrobiology to a hardcore um, biology professor, for example, I say, well, astrobiology is really evolutionary biology writ large because we bring in much more of the physical environment, what are the principles behind evolution could have happened elsewhere, what are the physical and chemical conditions on the earth that allowed this particular form of evolution, and so on. And so, again, you can see that we couldn't even start this course without understanding something about evolution. Well, Darwin was born uh, February 12, 1809. Um, very exciting last year because we had big 200th birthday celebrations and we could barely contain ourselves in the class that day. It was great fun. Um, but this, this year will be just as much fun. Um, 201 years ago tomorrow, many of you, I'm sure, will be taking the day off to celebrate. I've spent all day answering emails from students from the last few years wishing me a happy Darwin's birthday. You will now never forget February 12th every year. I expect to hear from you. <laughs> Ironically, it was the same day that Lincoln was born, of course, on the other side of, of the ocean. And there were many actual uh, parallels in their lives. They both. Besides being born the same day, mother died at about the same time, and all sorts of different sort of fun parallels. Um, as, um, isn't that a cute picture? That's, that's him as a little kid, obviously. Uh, he was the second son and the fifth child in a fairly large family. Um, as you probably know, one grandfather was Josiah Wedgwood, who started the whole Wedgwood um, factory, the, the pottery in England, became very wealthy, family of free thinkers. His father was um, Robert Darwin, who was a doctor. Um, his father, Erasmus Darwin, had been a court physician and also was very much a free thinker involved in founding the Lunar Society and um, was interested in the whole idea of species changing. Wrote up some of his ideas in poetry form, just sort of testing the waters. Um, there's always been a big question if his grandfather actually had any influence on him or not. I'm not entirely sure he did. Um, but he never knew this grandfather. Um, in fact, he didn't know his mother all that well. He doesn't write about her. His mother died when um, he was, what, eight years old or so. And so to a large extent, he was raised by his father and his older sisters, and then his brother, who was a, uh, just a few years older than he, Erasmus, who he's very close to. Um, trivia, even though I know that it's popular around Stanford to call him Chucky D, um, I don't know anyone who ever called him Chuck. What his parents called him from the time he was born is Bobby, because his father was Robert, and he was Charles Robert, Charles after an uncle who had just passed away, and Robert after his father, who, by the way, was an enormous man, um, say, a, apparently just towering in terms of his intellect, um, very good physician, but also invested a lot, and apparently about um, two-thirds or so of his money came from investment in railroads and so on, and, and loaning money to his people and doing various ventures in the area and so on. So he was not, you know, none of them were, were poorly off, they were, they were comfortable, but this kid was apparently fairly sensitive, mother died fairly young, he was a, a younger kid in a large family, and loved to just go off and collect beetles and this and that. Um, you know, he's one of those kids that apparently took care of himself. And um, at a fairly young age, he was sent off to the local school. And in those days, the idea of an education was you learned um, Latin and Greek and so on. And this was just absolutely the wrong thing for this little kid who really just loved being outside and, um, you know, playing and apparently used to sit under the table reading Robinson Crusoe and so on. Anyway, at some point, um, his father took him out of Shrewsbury School due to his poor grades. And because he had no direction in life, he was worried that nothing 
um, good would happen. And so at some point, um, having helped his father a little bit on his rounds in medicine, his father sent him to the University of Edinburgh for medical school. His brother was already there in medical school. His father had been to medical school at Edinburgh. It's still a very fine university. I know there are people in this room who have just applied to the University of Edinburgh, in fact. I'm not one of them. But there are people here who have. It's a very, very fine university. But the, there was good news and bad news. He did go to some chemistry lectures, which he enjoyed, and some geology lectures. But the medical aspects were a complete and utter failure. And the reason, there are two reasons that med school is an absolute an utter disaster for Darwin. One is he did not like to see pain and suffering in humans. And two, he couldn't stand the sight of blood. Now, neither of those are, are very good omens for someone who's going to be a physician. And in addition, remember, this was before anesthesia. And so when you went into an operating room um, and you were witnessing any sort of operation, much less something, um, well, you can just imagine what sort of things you might see. You've got enormous amounts of pain, suffering, and blood. And you can read this here. Um, so this was just the wrong thing for him. And he dropped out after two years and said, you know, I'm not doing this. I can't do this. And so the next best thing his father thought of is maybe he could be a clergyman. Um, the family was not highly religious in any sort of orthodox sense whatsoever. I think the feeling was it would be more of a gentleman, naturalist sort of, you know, country parsonage and you can do what you want, um, more or less, because there was a little bit of feeling that there were two ways to really understand God's wisdom. There's through his um, written works in the Bible and through the natural world, which fit with what he was interested in. So he went down to Cambridge. Um, there's a reconstruction of his rooms in Christ's College. Um, there's a, a, a drawing from the time. Um, he had to do a lot of studying to catch up. And again, it was mostly things like Greek and Latin. There was some mathematics that was required. At the time, you could not major in science. What he was doing was getting your basic Bachelor of Arts degree, which then qualified you to go on to study for the clergy or whatever. And it was kind of interesting. In fact, the word science wasn't even invented until 1820 by another uh, Cambridge professor, William Hewell. And so when he went, when people say he studied botany, for example, at Cambridge, he didn't study it by taking a course. You could go to lectures. And in fact, he became very close to um, the Reverend Henslow, who was sort of the botanist at the time. Um, but Again, you didn't take courses, you didn't major in science, um, but you could go to these lectures in geology and so on. Um, that's in the backs in Cambridge. Beautiful if you haven't been there. Um, highly recommend it. Um, now, this, the rumor is always that Darwin was a lousy student. In fact, he was not very good in elementary school. Um, he did have some catching up to do when he got to Cambridge, but apparently by the time he sat his final exams, he came in something like, 10th out of 175 who passed. So he, he was hardly this, you know, abject failure. Um, meantime, he picked up a girlfriend. He did spend a lot of time hunting and um, that kind of thing and say, you know, continue to go after beetles and so on. Um, and say he ended up um, doing actually fairly well. You can read all the details later. Um, so there's Reverend Henslow up there. It's not the greatest picture is obviously a good deal older than, um, than when Darwin knew him. He got to know Adam Sedgwick, who was a professor of geology, and um, attended his lectures, which he enjoyed a great deal, even though he really hadn't enjoyed geology when he'd been exposed to Jameson in Edinburgh. Um, and in fact, Henslow suggested that maybe before he settled down, Henslow was also one of those sort of gentleman naturalist professor types. Um, that maybe he do a little um, a little field work and go off. And so they had this big trip planned to Tenerife with a friend of his who unfortunately then died that summer. And so he was really depressed. He just graduated. They were going to have this big adventure. And then the, the friend passed away. And you know the, the fact that he was going to have to start studying to become a clergyman was looming. And that was not a very attractive proposition. Now, I'm sure many of you know that there was a letter that changed his life. Henslow was contacted by Admiral Fitzroy to see if he could recommend a naturalist to go and board the Beagle. Now, many people think that Darwin went as a gentleman's companion, but as we were showing the other day at the evolution um, event last Sunday, 
that in fact the ship's manifest says Charles Darwin, comma, naturalist. Um, so he was asked to go along as a naturalist. The purpose of this voyage was to get better maps for the Admiralty of South America in particular. And um, this fit in very nicely with what Darwin's interests were. It was something that he could do that would postpone being a clergyman. It sounded like a wonderful adventure and so on. And so he got very excited and his father said no. And he didn't argue with his father. As I mentioned, he was a very large man. He was about 300 pounds apparently when he died. So I mean, he was a large man, well over six foot. Darwin is pretty tall, but nothing like, you know, you don't argue with a 300 pound father who, who's knew everything, basically, and was this godlike character. Um, but his father realized how upset he was, so he said, if you can find any man of common sense who advises you to go, I will give my consent. So, of course, he immediately got on his horse and went off to see his uncle at Mayor House, um, his uncle Wedgwood, who was very supportive of him and said, well, you know, I think I can answer these objections. And these were his father's objections, that you, it would be disreputable to my character, it would be a wild scheme, they must have offered it to many other place, the people. And since it hadn't been accepted by anyone else, there must be a serious objection. I'll never settle down to a steady life hereafter. My accommodations would be uncomfortable, that I'm changing my profession again, and should be a useless undertaking. Well, his uncle obliged him by giving good responses to every one of these, which you can find in these various books that are floating around. And next thing he knew, he was buying new sets of pistols and um, new outfits, and off he went on the Beagle. Now, he was tremendously seasick most of the time, so he spent as much time as he could on the land. He collected some amazing samples, both geological but mostly biological. This is where learning taxidermy in Edinburgh came in, all his years hunting. Um, he's apparently a very good shot. Um, his beetle collecting, everything else all came together during this voyage. As we know, they spent some time at the Galapagos, not a lot of time. Uh, more time in South America, and I throw in these quotes so that it reminds you that he was, you know, he was very much a person. That's why people love to write about Darwin. Um, you know, okay, so they were all oogling the women in South America too, you know, just like you'd expect 20-some-year-old uh, males to do any time, right? <laughs> Um, so anyway, they spent a little time, as I mentioned, the Galapagos. I have never been to the Galapagos. I know there are people in this room who have, of which I am incredibly jealous. But here are a few pictures that were lent to me so that's so I can cry and sniffle. And um, I'm sure we all do want to go at some point. Um, by the way, I, I do have to tell one quick story that before he went on the Beagle, um, he was trying to get some more money from his father for an allowance. And um, he said, look, you know, I, I have to be very clever to spend over my allowance while I'm on board of a ship. And his father said, yes, but they tell me you are very clever. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it doesn't it sound like probably many of you, come on, Dad, a little more money, you know, I, I won't spend it. Okay, so <laughs> when he got home, his reputation preceded him because he'd sent back this huge number of samples that were being distributed to some of the top um, scientists in England already and um, other parts of the UK. And at that point, his, his brother, who had finished medical school, had decided not to practice either and was um, spent a lot of time introducing Darwin to various, um, in those days, men of letters and so on, and making the connections and making sure he met people in London and so on and so forth. And that's when he started his transmutation notebooks and various other notebooks um, which we won't go into in great detail. That's the first tree that he drew, um, at least that we know about. It's, it's marvelous because it doesn't look at all like the tree that I showed you of Heckel's, does it? And in fact, um, the historian the other day pointed out it really looks much more like a seaweed, which of course warms my heart. And you notice there isn't any great grand progress, which we know in this course to issue, but they're just branches that are going different places. Um, which is really very, very interesting. When by the time that got into the origin of species, it looks much more like a tree, but that was the first one. Um, as you might imagine, young man nearing 30, um, thoughts went to getting married. His girlfriend from um, college had since dropped him and gotten married herself. And um, not really knowing anyone else and always sort of taking a fondness to the daughter of this uncle who wrote the letter. Um, he went over to Mayor House um, and proposed to his cousin. Mm -hmm. But 
being Darwin, nothing simple. So he, he wrote up some notes to himself asking whether he should marry or not, looking at the pros and cons, which we, we still have to this day. Um, maybe he'd be mortified to think that people were showing this in classes, because these were clearly private notes. The advantages of not marrying and remaining a bachelor, um, you know, this, is, this would be great freedom to go where one like, choice of society, conversation of clever men at clubs, not forced to visit relatives, have the expense and anxiety of children, perhaps quarreling, listen to that, loss of time, cannot read in the evenings, fatness, idleness, doesn't paint a very good picture of getting married, does it? Anxiety, responsibility, less money for books, many children forced to gain one's bread, um, perhaps my wife won't like London, and then I'm banished, you know, degradation, and so on and so forth. This is before he'd actually proposed. And then, of course, there was the plus side, to marry children, if it pleased God. He had a ton of children. Constant companion will feel interested in one, a friend in old age, an object to be loved and played with better than a dog. <laughs> Someone to take care of the house, classics of music and female chit-chat. This is very hard to believe, but they didn't have iPods in those days. So it's, it's a very, very different era here. Things good for one's health, forced to visit and receive relations. Notice that was crossed out but terrible loss of time, and this is, this is sort of the wonderful conclusion. My God, it's unthinkable to think of spending one's whole life like a neuter bee, working, 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 and nothing after all. No, no, won't do. Imagine living all one's day solitarily in smoky, dirty London house. Only picture to yourself a nice, soft wife on a sofa with a good fire, books and music, perhaps. Compare this vision with dingy reality of Great St. Marlborough Street. Mary, 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 Q E D. <laughs> so off he went to get married, and then you know what? Should, when should it be? Sooner or later. Um, and then it, it, I won't read you the whole thing, but it says at the end, never mind, my boy, cheer up. One cannot live this solitary life with growing old age, friendless and cold and childless, staring one in one's face, already beginning to wrinkle. Never mind. Trust to chance. Keep a sharp lookout. There is many a happy slave. Uh, so he went off, and he married his beautiful cousin, Emma Wedgwood, um, in 1839. And um, they lived for a few years in London, I believe, and then moved out into the countryside, Down House, which you can visit today. It's about two hours by public transportation, which I understand is about what it took in Darwin's day as well. It's actually not that far. It's just one of those, it's hard to get here from there type things with narrow roads and so on. But it's a lot of fun to go there. And again, I know there's some people in the room who have um, been there and it's well worth it. Uh, you can go inside the house, you can go on his sand walk where he took walks a couple of times a day, um, thinking and playing with the kids and so on. Um, he kept going on his ideas of transmutation. He didn't actually use the word evolution um, at that point. His evolution referred more to development unfolding at the time. He became close friends with a lot of people who ended up, you know, forming ranks around him, like Joseph Perkler, who was a botanist. He began his eight-year barnacle project. He wrote the definitive works on barnacle that I believe held up for many, many, many years after that. Um, there's not that there's enormous competition in the barnacle phylogeny field, but you know, still it was quite an achievement. Apparently by the end of it, he said, I, you know, I am sicker of barnacles than a sailor. I, I can't stand another barnacle. Um, one story is that one of his kids was at a friend's house and he said his father was at work and they said, well, if your father's at work during the day, when does he do his barnacles? I mean, this is, the, can you imagine, he was working at home eight years in this house of barnacles. But he was working on many other things at the time and part of it is he was amassing evidence for this grand work that he was going to write. And then, out of the blue, he gets a letter from a young naturalist, um, Alfred Russell Wallace, who um, Professor Plumby is going to be speaking more on in a few moments. And that's where we get to the second anniversary of last year, and that was the publication of The Origin of Species in November. But before that, the arrangement was that Darwin and Wallace would co-present um, a paper at the Linnaean Society. Actually, neither of them were present. Um, I only point this out because I, too, am a fellow of the Linnaean Society and got to sign the book that Darwin signed when he became a member, and my hand was shaking like this. I don't know why, because he was, you know, so many pages before, but it was just so cool. And now his portrait is up on the wall, as you might imagine, instead of the others. Um, 
Origin of Species came out in November 1859, sold out basically the first day. It's now been through six editions, as I mentioned to you the other day. Read either the first or the sixth edition. Don't bother with the middle ones. And um, you can see it's, it's very readable. You know, I went on board the HMS Beagles and Naturals. I was much struck with certain um, facts on the distribution of organic beans. I mean, this is, except for the fact that it's 19th century English, it's very accessible. So I encourage you to read some of it, I, as I encouraged you on Tuesday at some point. Uh, you don't need to read every word of it, uh, because what he's doing is amassing a huge amount of evidence to try to convince you. But what I did suggest is that you at least read the table of contents, because I want to give you the, the boot camp structure. And what we'll do is focus for a minute on the first four chapters. The first one is variation under domestication. So you start from a point that no one can argue with. Look at the pigeons that we breed. They, that was very popular at the time. Look at horses. Look at orchids. Look at peas. Look at you know whatever you want that we breed. Cats, dogs, anything, and you see variation. We don't all look the same. So that's chapter one. No one can possibly argue with that. Every organism, there's variation among the species. Among the species. So the second chapter, he takes you. Okay, you're with me so far. There's variation in nature. And we can look around this room, and we have a set of twins in the room. We have people whose brothers I know, but that doesn't, you know. We have, we have parent-child combination. We've got all sorts of things this year in this room. And yet, no two of us look alike. Right? No two of us look alike. So there's variation in nature as well. Now, we know from mouses that more organisms are born than can survive. You get a frog laying, you know, a gazillion eggs. You've got E. coli that can double every 20 minutes under the right conditions, or yeast every hour and a half, or, you know, humans or elephants, or whatever you want to take, that we have the ability to reproduce much faster than the carrying capacity of the environment is able to allow. So the question is, who, is the one, who are the ones who are going to be able to pass their genes on to the next generation? And what he says is, what I call this idea is natural selection. It's exactly parallel to this artificial selection, going back to the organisms under domestication, that we are imposing on plants and animals and have for thousands of years with this breeding. So if you think about it, the logic is so compelling, and it's so simple to take people through. And that's why in about 10 years, the top scientific minds in the world, for the most part, had said, the argument's over. It's settled. They went from not believing in evolution, for the most part, to all saying, yep, that's right. Now, not everyone agrees with the mechanism. Not everyone you know, agrees with all parts of it, and as I've mentioned to you before, there are a lot of other mechanisms out there, and the day the dinosaurs went extinct, that was a lousy 15 minutes, and they didn't do anything wrong, it was not their fault, it was just a really bad hair day, things happen. But the fact is, this is a very powerful explanation for the diversity that we see around us, and probably does happen in some very large amount of um, the diversity that we see. Now, from there, he goes on to the laws of variation. Ironically, he knew nothing about Mendel. Apparently, a copy of Mendel's book was in his study when he died, and the pages weren't even cut. Difficulties with the theory, which is, takes a very mature scientist to say, OK, I'm going to tell you all the problems with what I've just said. And here are all the ways you could poke holes in it. And most of those we've plugged up since then. He talks a little about instinct hybrids, imperfection of the geological record. He said it was very much like a book where you take out 90% of the pages and then 90% of the remaining paragraphs and 90% of the remaining sentences. And you're left with a few words and you're trying to piece together the original book. Um, and so on and so forth. And then you get to this last paragraph, which people read all the time. Um, how many people have never seen this before? Then I'll read it quickly because it really is so beautiful. It's the very end of the origin of species. It's the only time that the word evolution, anything related to evolution, is in there. What he says is, it's interesting to contemplate an entangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth. He doesn't forget anyone, does he? 
and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms so different from each other that the variation and dependent on each other in so complex a manner have all been produced by laws acting around us. That that's the marvelous thing is that nature is being produced by laws, not just some random arbitrary extraterrestrial whatever. These laws taken in the largest sense being growth with reproduction, inheritance, which is almost implied by reproduction, variability from the indirect and direct action of external circumstances. He was not a Lamarckian, but he did have some very strange ideas on inheritance because they just didn't know at the time and he was not aware of Mendel. Um, variability, let's see, so on and so forth, use and disuse. Ratio of increase so high as to lead for a struggle for life and as a consequence to natural selection entailing divergence of character and extinction of less improved forms. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of a higher animals, follows, directly follows. And this is just absolutely beautiful, this end here. There is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. God, it sounds like astrobiology, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, that that's just, he's saying, let me give you a vision, the scientific vision of the diversity of life. And it's it's so beautiful the way he puts it. And that's why I'm very offended when people say, oh, you know, evolution, it's it's sort of godless, atheist, you know, and it ruins the beauty. No, this is a very beautiful view of the world. Um, obviously, there were mixed reactions to this. Some people loved it, some people hated it. There's a very famous um, back and forth that went on. Um, with Bishop Wilberforce, which we will see if you see some of this movie, otherwise you can see it yourself. And Bishop Wilberforce ended up um, getting into this back and forth with Huxley and um, saying to Huxley, okay, are you descended from the monkeys from your father's side or your mother's side? And he said, I would rather be descended from a monkey than to be a clergyman from the Church of England who is misusing the powers that God gave him. You know, one of those sort of things. Apparently women fainted in the halls. And, you know, so it was very exciting, I'm sure. I wasn't actually there. Maybe you can see it on YouTube, though, probably. Um, anyway, there's, there's, you can get the, all the highlights of the Oxford debate, you know, the big gossip of the time. Um, and, as I say, it quickly started to gain acceptance. Um, intermediates like Archaeopteryx, which is this transitional form between birds and dinosaurs, was found. Uh, journal Nature was found. Huxley turned the coin agnostic. Huxley became known as Darwin's bulldog because he was an enormous supporter of his and got up and out and um, pushed. So Darwin did not, you know, rest quietly. He did write The Descent of Man, which came out a um, little over 10 years later, which really was the last part of The Origin of Species, because he avoided man in The Origin of Species, specifically. There's just one little line about this may shed some light on our origins. Um, he did, you know, stay mostly at his house and enjoyed his kids and so on. They say he was a very unusual Victorian father. There's a story about one of his kids jumping up and down on the sofa and he said, you know, I told you I didn't want to see you doing that. And his son said to him, well then perhaps you better leave the room, Papa. Now, Victorian era kids did not talk to their fathers like that. And the fact that he thought it was cute enough to write down says a lot about him as a father who's totally different than his own father had been with him. Um, and oh, I drew this in, you know, domestic life. Um, apparently loved playing backgammon. Um, you can read that on your own. Uh, but he continued to work. He wrote about earthworms. He wrote um, ideas on inheritance, to say descent of man. It goes on and on, the evolution of emotions. This guy wrote book after book, and they're just, well, I can't say that they're all wonderful, but because I haven't read the one on the earthworms, I will admit. Um, there you go, insectivorous plants so on and so forth. He wrote a little autobiography, as I mentioned before, but that was for his family rather than for anyone else. Honorary degrees, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and he did die, of course, as happens, April 19th, um, 1882, and he thought that he was going to be buried in the churchyard um, and down, not because he was, you know, a, a big member of the church, but that's sort of where 
people in the community were buried, but almost immediately there was a group of his um, friends and colleagues who started a petition that went to the um, parliament and ultimately to the dean of Westminster Abbey, um, mm -hmm. feeling that it would be very important to have Darwin buried in Westminster Abbey. And that's where he is today. He is buried next to Newton. So you can go see his grave there. Um, here are a whole bunch of fun books or serious books or whatever, but this gives you some references so you can get your fix of Darwinania anytime. And as I mentioned to you the other day, this Darwin Online website is fantastic. It's got um, copies of a lot of his books that you can download. I noticed the other day it was pretty slow. They're, I think they're mostly scans, so they're huge files even <coughs> on campus. But well worth looking at. And what I'm going to do now, rather than take any questions, because I've already gone way, way too much, um, is we're going to have a short entertainment interlude. Yes. Is that correct? That's yes. True. Okay. You're on. That's true. Josh, you want to introduce us? Me? Yeah, for oh, sure. Stop. He's a CA. I'm bio. So guys, are we gonna bring it up? <laughs> yep. So uh, yeah, CA. I'm bio. This is my second year. This is Sam right here. He uh, he joined me on a class led by Bill Durham that went to the Galapagos this uh, past September, sophomore college, kind of a fun trip, right? That's right. Um, and while on that trip, we were kind of brainstorming music. We were clearly engrossed in the material. Um, Learned a lot about Darwin, a lot about evolution. We put together a little song. Okay. Yeah, we good. Um, so, 3.5 to infinity, here it is. The lyrics will be up there because it goes kind of quick. Um, it's an homage to a song called 93 Till Infinity by Souls of Mischief. Anybody heard of that song? Yes, yeah. one person. Excellent. <laughs> Hanging out in 1993. Exactly. Written by Tajay Massey, who's a Stanford right. graduate. Um, we're just going to do it. Probably be some overlap with this, the, the talk you just heard, but more yeah, rhyming so. on this one. Um, and we're missing our third, our third uh, colleague, so we're going to have to kind of divide up the lyrics as we go. It'll be a surprise. Ready? It'll be a surprise. <laughs> All right. Um, so, you want to say any in introducing words right now? I'm right, moved by the moment. Shout out to, what is it, Astro Bio? Shout out to Astro Bio. Astro we're happy Bio. to be here right now. We're very happy to be here. Um, Thanks. And we're excited to share this with you. And we're about to do it like this. So there's this little theory, some people fear it But if you want to know the history of life, you gotta hear it And if you're feeling leery, then stop and hear me And what better place to start than with Charles Darwin Dang, that's, that's the fattest book I ever seen The origin of species got me feeling like I'm feeding for some reading I'm descent with modification So many barnacles, so much variation He got inspired by some bitches Not to mention Thomas Robbins and his struggle for existence Think about it there were hella elephants Going exponentially when none remained made celibate We'd always put in an elemental juices So what decides who survives and reproduces? Diverse competitors, environment conditions Must remember what CD learned from vision and with pigeons By selecting their fates and making them He can shake some pretty wild traits as if creating them And if man can do it, then why not natural forces? Diversity, heredity, people struggle for resources Combined together, weeding out the mocking birds Just like a fitness lease, like an offspring The successful lineage is free to grow It's evolution and it started 3.5 billion years ago. This is how I build from 3.5 till. 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 We need some help. This is how I build from 3.5 till. 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 The theories make it sense, but this is science, so where's your evidence? Life makes colossal moves, that's what fossils prove, and Archie, Opteryx should really jostle you. Plus, take a look at deoxyribo, nucleic acid in every cell that I know. The basic building blocks of life, in me, in your mama, in a llama, and in boobies. Plus a new disease, <laughs> protist, and comparing embryos and animals to help you notice. You know this, so let's hit Galapagos, where well, we dropping flows while lava goes top and pole. Galapagos, it's evolution in the flesh A few millimeters might mean life or death Speciation got me feeling psychotic Got 20 fish ribs and they all freeze I got it I'm doing a power to Christ, male desire A sexually selected trait that males acquire An extraordinary adaptation A freaking prerequisite for copulation Amazing, 
the way that life keeps living. But the truth is, with humans, it's not always a given. So best to show some respect for life, lest ya forget we all share a common ancestor. This is how life builds from 3.5 till. 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 Woo! That's it. Appreciate you having us here. Yeah. This guy's an expert on um, flightless, cormorants. flightless cormorants. You guys have any questions about them? Anybody heard of flightless cormorants? Like, What's that? Can they fly? <laughs> Not fly. <laughs> Learn something. Yeah. Cool. They well, generally swim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you for having may, us. Maybe may be as old as uh, when we talked about about 4.2, 4.3 billion years ago. We'll have to update you. Oh, yeah? But, you know, it seems silly since we we have um, these guest stars and that we don't move on to a little refreshment right now while uh, Professor Plumlee sets up his slides, and then we'll move into the second half of the festivities. Sound good? Thanks, Lynn. Um, thank you, and uh, just to do the commercial for the Hopkins Marine Station. Uh, we're 90 minutes south of here in Monterey. We run classes in the winter and the spring quarter. Um, the best education value for your money or your parents' money um, that Stanford has, Stanford has to offer. So um, if you want really uh, in-depth courses, working with the faculty, working on, on research projects, and if particularly if you love the ocean, then um, come, come visit us, see what we have to, to offer. Uh, one of the things we do is teach core biology down there, at least the, the, we teach the ecology and evolution series. Um, I'm going to do the evolutionary part of it. Uh, the, what I want to sort of do to follow what Lynn has done and, and that fabulous rep, which is a really difficult thing to follow, um, is to talk a little bit about, about Darwin, because uh, Lynn really wanted to have a historic aspect to, the, to what we were talking about, and, wh and how, how Darwin brought together the different ideas that you've heard about, and also to talk, to have you talk a little bit about, about expanding from the kinds of things that Darwin um, thought about. Uh, I like to think about the, the core of what Darwin talked about for natural selection and evolution as being this engine of, of evolution uh, layout. These are the things you need in a system so that things can evolve. Um, there has to be very variation among the individuals in that system, and the variation has to correspond or result in different reproductive success, and the things themselves have to be able to, to reproduce. Um, and then there has to be some kind of um, inheritance from parent to offspring. And if these three things happen, then the system will evolve. Now, a question that I have for you um, is does the system have to be alive for these things to, to be true? Well, we talked about this in the origin of life class. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. There isn't anything in that that says they have to be alive. Yeah. Uh, it, they have to be copied in some way, but they don't have to necessarily be alive. To be copied. Well, what are, so what are what are some of the things that might not be alive and could st and still follow follow all these all these things? Viruses. Viruses. Mm, viruses can't do that on their own, right? They can be copied, but you're right. They can evolve, um, and they uh, most people would consider them them uh, alive, probably. But they're on the edge because they're not really uh, they can't really do that all that by themselves. Um, Exactly. That's a great. That's a great idea. Um, Rich, <laughs> how and so follow that up a little bit. Well, among uh, different individuals, we have different ideas. Variation among individuals. Mm -hmm. Variation. Uh, some ideas are better than others, for, uh, which could lead to you know reproductive success. For example, I could decide to jump out of a plane, or I could decide to jump out of a plane with a parachute. There's one idea that's clearly superior than the other one. Well, maybe not superior, but a lot. <laughs> and the chances of winning capitalism are much greater. And then um, these ideas are passed on, and then eventually, you know, and it comes down from 
maintain the idea of somebody else receiving it and it just gets distributed. Exactly. So a really good. Idea. And Richard Dawkins um, talked about that in a in a in a book called The Selfish Gene. He called those memes. And that term has popped up in movies and television shows and um, all uh, since then. Um, the unit of uh, the I evolving idea is the meme. I, don't know, I, I guess the way technology also evolves, it's like something like that evolves to get a whole lot of people in it. It has an evolution now. Mm -hmm. I guess you could say how it comes into its place, so it's probably what the player is doing that. It's just a good way to be a player to know that I want to know what's going on. It could be the difference in that is that there those iPods are not reproducing themselves, unfortunately. Um, otherwise, you could just put two in a drawer, and then in about three months, you can come back, and there'd be lots of little nanos in, the <laughs> in there. Um, but if you extend that further, if you really like your iPod, and you get another one because you really like it, you're forcing somebody else to replicate that thing for you. And so if you, you, could, you could make it work. Um, but there's other kinds of technology that actually do th are, are a little more close to that. Um, computer viruses, for example, have all these, all these features. They're, they're, not, they're not alive, but they mutate, they replicate, and they, they have differential uh, reproductive success. So things like that um, ca count. Uh, but let's take it one step down uh, from viruses. What about genes? Genes aren't really alive. They're just part of the living, the living machinery. But genes uh, by themselves have a lot of these, have all these three traits. They vary. They're copied. They're copied by your cells, your cells, not themselves. Um, and they, they confer different fitness attributes to the cells they're in. And so again, the idea of selfish genes uh, was something that Darwin would never have thought about because he didn't know anything about the genes. Um, but it's, the kind, it's a kind of system that can evolve um, on its own. So, the key here is that is these are pretty simple ideas. Uh, these three things together are not that hard to come by. But the flip side is, if, the, if they occur, evolution is not possible. Evolution will happen. And that's because there is always, the variation is going to be there. If there's variation, uh, eventually that variation will have something to do with reproduction. And once it does, evolution will begin to happen to it because there are these dif differential fitness effects um, in it. So evolution is not something that is a possibility, really, when you have these things. It more or less is the predicted thing to happen. And part of what Lynn talked about was the rapid acceptance of evolution in the, in the late 1800s was because of this. Once these things got together and once people had the idea of it in their heads, they realized, well, it wasn't something that really could maybe occur. It was something that really was a logical conclusion about the way that, that nature was all put together. So that is why evolution had so many primary um, uh, proponents right from the very beginning. And it was the consequences of these things that got people all exercised and, and made, them, made them upset about it. Um, let's see. There we go. No. Um, so, if it was so f obvious, um, why did Darwin take so long to do it? It wasn't just because he was well-to-do um, and, and uh, had a nice domestic life playing backgammon and, and, and having children. Um, this, is his, this is his timeline. Uh, the first essay at about 1840, uh, four years after the Beagle, um, he basically in that first essay had it all. He had all the elements. He knew what the answer was. He got it pretty well. Um, he rewrote it start four years later in the second essay in 1944, um, uh, 1844. But it wasn't until 1858 that that paper was presented to the Royal Society, and then The Origin of Species was published in <laughs> 1859. Right. So, so whoever's got the piece of paper, you can write that down now. Um, so what explains the delay? Um, the, the, a, a delay has two parts. A delay has the part where you don't do nothing, and then the part where you go ahead and do it. 
right? Um, and so the delay is explained by Darwin is reticent to come out with these ideas because he knows there's going to be a strong backlash about it in terms of people. If evolution applies to animals and people are animals and evolution would apply to people and the theological uh, aspects of that were something he was really worried about. And so that really delayed things. He was also not all that sure he could amass the evidence he really needed because he got this idea after the voyage of the Beagle. So what he had was evidence that had, he'd gathered up, but he'd gathered up that evidence for different reasons and he was putting things together along the way. But that explains the delay. So what explains the spark? What explains why he decided to go ahead in 1858 and do this? Uh, Alfred Russell Wallace contacted So Alfred Ruffel Russell Wallace sent him a letter. So who was Alfred Russell Wallace? Um, can't understand Darwin until you understand a little bit about Alfred Russell Wallace. Russ Wallace was a, a collector. Uh, he didn't have all the money that Darwin's family did. He got a university degree. He, be, he had spent a few years as a surveyor around England. And then he decided to go out in the world and make his money by going to South America, for example, collecting all kinds of amazing creatures, preserving them, and shipping them back to London for sale. So he was essentially a, 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 a he collected critters for museums and private, um, private parties. Uh, he didn't have a whole lot of money. He spent a lot of time doing this stuff, and he, he didn't have very good luck. Uh, he spent many years in South America collecting all kinds of wonderful things. He put them on a single boat. So you can tell that this was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Sent him to London. The boat sank. He'd lost everything. Um, he eventually uh, meandered over to Indonesia, where he did the same thing, collecting specimens and sending them back to London for sale. He was a fabulous naturalist. He uh, first named something called, that's now called Wallace's Line, which runs between Bali and Lombok. And it's a bi-geographic zone um, compared where the fauna of southeastern Asia hits the fauna of Australasia. Uh, but he also spent a lot of time in the field. And in his, his autobiography, uh, as Darwin has spent 14 years developing the idea of evolution and writing it all down in exquisite detail, um, Alfred Russell Wallace gets malaria. And in a three-day malarial fever, invents the theory of evolution by natural selection on his own. Um, he was laying in his bed in, in a small island. Uh, this is the island in Indonesia where where he was stricken by malaria in Jililo in Indonesia in 1858. And then he writes, it occurred to me then, as he's sort of dreaming in this sort of malarial fog, that these causes, he's thinking about death at this point, um, or their equivalents are so continuously acting on the case of animals, and animals unusually breed much more rapidly than does mankind, because Wallace also had read Malthus's essay on the ability of animals to over-reproduce. Uh, the destruction every year from these causes must be enormous in order to keep down the numbers of each species, since they evidently do not increase regularly from year to year, as otherwise the world would, no would long ago have been densely crowded with those that breed more quickly. So he's basically got the idea here of something limiting reproduction. Something must be keeping these organisms from over-reproducing. Over uh, and then he's thinking about this constant destruction it occurred to me to ask the question, why do some die and some live? And the answer was clearly on the whole that the best fitted live. And this is where the phrase, the survival of the fittest, actually comes from. Uh, from the effects of disease, the most healthy escape, from enemies, uh, the strongest, the swiftest, or the most cunning, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then it suddenly flashed upon me that this self-acting process would necessarily improve the race because in every generation, the inferior would inevitably be killed off and the superior would remain, that is, the fittest would survive. So in two paragraphs, three days in a malarial fog, um, Wallace invents evolution. Well, here's the situation then. Uh, he's in the middle of Indonesia. He doesn't know what really quite to do. He's got this great idea, he thinks, but he's kind of a nobody. Nobody knows who he is, but he knows some other people. And one person that he knows 
thinks about these kinds of things is things is things is things is things is things is in the world. What do you do? <laughs> Especially if you're a gentleman, exactly. Um, uh, so this is, what, this is what Darwin decided to do, co-publish. Now this was a little bit of a wrench for Darwin, a relatively wealthy, well-connected gentleman of letters in England who has been developing a theory for 18 years, has put a huge amount of time and energy into it, and some upstart from Indonesia writes him a letter, and all of a sudden he's got to co-publish with him. But Darwin had a history of this kind of thing. It's not very well known, but when Darwin went to Edinburgh to, to study medicine and hated it, you're exactly right, for all those same reasons, he didn't immediately quit. He started studying marine biology in Edinburgh. And he worked with a professor there uh, and made a few discoveries about simple things in marine biology, like bryozoans were animals instead of plants. Um, and his professor published them himself without any mention of Darwin. So Darwin actually made a several, several interesting low-level uh, discoveries. And each time, his professor basically scooped him on it. He left Edinburgh largely for that reason. He just couldn't stand it anymore. Um, he had already given up medicine by then and, uh, and, then, and then went on to Cambridge the way, the way Lynn said. So he had already experienced this, this problem of somebody taking his ideas and running with them without <coughs> accreditation. So he couldn't do that to Wallace. Instead, he wrote many letters to his friends out in the world saying, uh, you, guys, you guys know that I thought of this, right? <laughs> I did tell you, didn't I? And they all said, yeah, yeah, we, we know. And in fact, uh, many of them had copies of letters that Darwin had, or had, they had the letters that Darwin had written to, to them. So in the Royal Society, two things were read at that, that, that famous night. One, hmm? you're right, the Linnaean Society. Um, <laughs> uh, one was uh, Wallace's letter about this process. The other was a letter that Darwin had actually written to a third party, Hooker, I think, um, that laid out the same kind of argument. And so by doing that, that, that was co-publishing, co-describing the discovery, and it established in a kind of gentlemanly way, like, yes, I thought of this long ago, but <coughs> Wallace also thought of it and deserves a lot of credit for coming at the idea, too. And, and from that time, uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection has been um, credited to both Darwin and Wallace, although Darwin went ahead and promoted it, uh, provided most of the evidence for it, and was really the lightning rod around which the idea really found. But it was an, it's an interesting part of the history of evolutionary biology that the idea itself was not so unusual that somebody else couldn't think of it. And it was somebody else thinking of it that really sparked um, Darwin into, into going ahead with his, his notion about things. Um, so I've sort of described evolution in, in, in terms of a being more or less uh, kind of inevitable and would, uh, would actually play a big role in the way organisms, all organisms would evolve. Um, and. Uh, I don't want to go much longer 
um, because there's other stuff that needs to go on, like this, like the movie today. But I want to sort of leave you with um, a couple of other instances of the a little bit more of a, the complexity of evolutionary biology. Because once you have the basic idea down, it turns out that it becomes more complicated than that over time. Um, in particular, uh, if evolution occurs, and it, it occurs relatively rapidly, um, what limits it? Evolution is not all powerful. Evolution, in fact, has many limits to the way that it can change organisms over space and over time, some of which are pretty, are pretty obvious. One of the things that we talk about a lot in limiting evolution is uh, we're stuck with our basic body plan. It's very difficult for us to sprout uh, wings or grow five new legs. It can happen. In fact, frogs can grow five legs. Uh, they don't do so well um, in general. They don't, they don't survive. But major body plans don't tend to change that quickly because our developmental system uh, is set to produce certain kinds of things. So evolution tends to work over small changes um, bit by bit by bit. But the other kinds of things that really tends to limit evolutionary change in a broad, in a broad set of um, cases are trade-offs. We tend to think about the survival of the fittest as if survival is dependent upon just one aspect of environment. But in fact, survival and reproduction are often uh, actually dependent upon different sorts of traits in different, in different organisms. And, and all I want to do is just give you one, one sort of example about that. Um, these are frogs. Um, frogs uh, mate uh, in the spring all over the world. And there's a large amount of selection for um, large body size. The m larger a body you have if you're female, the more eggs that you can produce. Um, but there's also selection among males for high frequency and loud calls. The mating system of frogs is pretty, uh, pretty um, familiar to most people. Uh, males call. Um, females come to males that have calling at the right intensity and the right frequency. And the male chorus of frogs around a pond is essentially uh, the chorus of, of males calling for females in order to basically attract them. So there's something that Darwin called sexual selection, which is selection just on a trait that has to do with reproduction, not on survival. So males are selected to be relatively large and very loud in order to attract females. Um, however, it doesn't work out all that well uh, in, in many cases because there's trade-offs involved. Uh, calling frogs attract the attention of more than just females. They attract, uh, in this case, uh, these are Tangara frogs in Panama, and there's a, there's a, a specific species of bat that eats male frogs calling around, around ponds. So in this particular case, this is, this is one of the best photographs, I think, uh, ever in the wildlife lexicon. This is the embodiment of the trade-off um, between reproductive success, calling, and then uh, mortality. In this particular case, evolution uh, for, for louder calls is at a real pivot. An individual that calls more loudly might be more fit when it comes to attracting females, but as it's a lot less fit when it comes to attracting bats. And so the evolution of this system is really balanced between these two opposing forces of sexual selection and natural selection. That's often where um, evolution ends up. It ends up uh, balanced between opposing forces, uh, how selection acts differently on the same kinds of traits. And that's why, it, that's why it seems like, in a lot of cases, that organisms may evolve and then go into what Stephen Jay Gould called stasis. They don't change for many, 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 many millions of years. Not because evolution has stopped, but because evolution is balanced between these different forces. Uh, in this particular case, the sex sexual selection and natural selection. So um, the study of evolution is not just the study of things changing over time. It's the study of how these forces act on organisms, and most of the time when they're complicated, trade-offs occur leading to this sort of uh, basic uh, relationship among the different evolutionary 
trends. Darwin knew about that because he thought about it for quite a lot of time after the origins of the species. Uh, he published The Des Descent of Man. He published uh, a book on sexual selection, all of which showed him that there were different traits that uh, evolution acted on, and those traits weren't separate from one another, that they all combined in organisms. The whole organism itself then was a reflection of the e evolutionary pressures acting on it from all kinds of different directions. So um, given that it's late and that we've all had cake and we're sort of in a sucrose coma, um, I'm going to stop there. I can talk, take questions. We can go on to your next thing, do the movie, whatever you want to do. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.